panel discussion, something that we've been all waiting for. Um, I only have one microphone, so you guys are going to have to share. So, Brian, you're going to go first anyways. <laughs> all right, what am I doing? Okay. So my name is Elena Nabi. I'm going to be the moderator today during our panel discussion. I'm joined here by Brian, Craig, and Sean. And combined, I think you guys have over 40 years of experience, if not more. But anyways, here we, here, here we listen. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to be old to have experience nowadays. So here you are. So let's uh, get into our first topic, traction, right? I guess traction is something that every founder or future founder uh, struggles with. Personally, I've struggled with myself. So I want to know, uh, um, Brian, we're going to start with you, right? So we're going to start with you. Uh, I want to know how you get, how you, uh, how you started CodeKit. Like, you know, what happened, uh, and how did you get your first customers? Sure. Um, so I have a really kind of odd story. Uh, let me preface this by saying that my success story isn't necessarily going to be your success story. Um, I really hate it when people get up after they've had some success and they're like, well, I did this and so can you. Um, take what you want from what I'm going to say, but, but don't count on just replicating exactly what I did. What I'll tell you is, what helped me a lot with CodeKit is before I did CodeKit, years before that, I released something called less.app. Um, at the time, I was a freelance website builder, um, and I was just finding clients off Craigslist, you know, little mom and pop shops and building little websites. Um, and I wanted to use variables in CSS. Couldn't believe that didn't exist. Still can't believe we got to 2020 without it existing. That's a different story. But um, I, I Googled for it, and they said, um, well, you can't do it in CSS, but you can do it in this less thing, this other language. And to compile that, you got to run this terminal command. So I figured I'll build a little free app that all it does is watch files, and when I save it, it compiles it to CSS. And I built that app, and I put it up for free on the internet, and I thought maybe five people would use it. Turns out it was downloaded millions of times um, around the world. And so when I went to launch CodeKit years later, what I had actually done is build this massive following of people who had experience with my work um, for free, right? And I had like a built-in market that the minute I launched CodeKit, you know, people just started buying it because they all had used less.app and I had this Twitter following. So I, I literally, for over a decade, I did zero advertising for CodeKit. I just put a tweet out at 3 a.m. and said, hey, I got this new thing now. And uh, people went and bought it because I had spent years doing the, the free kind of almost like a, a pre, you know, pre-start, pre-starting thing to get traction before I ever launched the thing where I was trying to make money. So if, if you are smart enough to plan ahead, instead of just looking back with 2020 hindsight, and you can set something like that up, um, do that. Because if the more you can get people to follow your work or use whatever you're creating for free, when you turn around and start then charging money for it or char charging money for a new thing, you will have a built-in following that just comes with you automatically. And uh, that worked great for me. I highly recommend it. So, uh, so less up, like it sounded like a fairy tale to me, like, right? So you just let it, uh, let it try for five people and then millions just showed up. So would you say that? Yeah. Um, yes, my my trajectory through uh, CodeKit has been a fairy tale, right? Okay. It is not the uh, it is the exception to the rule. It is not the rule. What I will say is the thing that you build can't suck because if it sucks, right? If it doesn't solve the problem people yeah. need to solve, um, then they're not going to automatically follow you, right? But if you identify a problem, you solve it well, right? You do good work and put that out there, um, you will find that they, they will follow you, right? And the other thing I'll say about CodeKit is I hit the market at exactly the right time. You know, I predate Node.js. I know we, we forget that Node.js ever wasn't a thing. Uh, it turns out we did have a world without Node.js at some point, um, and Grunt and Gulp and all these other tools, right, that came along and React and all that garbage. Um, so I predate all of that and shipped well before all of that happened, right? If you were going to do the same thing right now, you would not have the same success. So there is an, an element of market timing in it as well. Okay, okay. So Sean, let's uh, get to you. So tell me, uh, you founded Place, 
right? And you did get placed to one million users at some point, right? One of the communities. So I hope that your story was not a fairy tale, so we can... <laughs> no, no my, uh, my story, at least with getting my career started, was uh, slightly different. All that I've done my entire career is say, yes, I can totally do that to things that I have no idea how to do. <laughs> Um, and Place, which we originally launched as Backplane, was a perfect example of that. Prior to that, I somewhat, uh, again, I, I was working at, um, at a local company called Bump.com with a guy named Mitch Thrower, who, um, and at the time when I graduated, I was so poor that I just went to him and said, hey, look, man, I have $9 in my checking account. I either need a real job or, like, I need to move home. And he was like, hold on a second called a bunch of investors, and then ultimately I ended up having the opportunity to help co-found a couple of companies um, with a gentleman named Matt Mickelson, um, who, where we, again, through a series of saying, yes, we can absolutely do that, and then walking out of the meeting and saying, what did we just agree to? Um, and then somehow just figuring it out and trying to get it out the door. Um, by doing that, we ultimately ended up working with Lady Gaga and a couple other pretty big brands. Uh, we ended up uh, brokering and helping set up and run and launch uh, what was the largest integrated marketing campaign of the time, um, which was the uh, Lady Gaga's Born This, Way Born This Way album launch and her tour. Um, we, did, we had helped set up a partnership with Zynga at peak Farmville epidemic. Um, and we did a, we did a, a reskin of that as Gagaville, and then you would plant crystals. Uh, you would plant crystals, and those crystals would bloom into a music player, and that was the only place where you could hear this album uh, in the weeks leading up to it. Um, a lot of these models have all gotten reproduced since then. Um, but then again, that was really kind of me, I think, going back to timing, like me really just being in the right place at the right time and, uh, and just totally agreeing confidently to things that I had no capability, qualification, or really reason for people to trust me to be able to do. So how did you get your first users? Um, how did you get the start? So with Gaga, it was, it was a bit of an easier one, right? Because she, at the time, was the largest social media footprint on the planet. Uh, at the time, I think it was like this is, was 2010, so she was about 85 million, um, which like pale in comparison to numbers now, where people who like play Minecraft or teach people how to put on eyeliner have that many followers. <laughs> um, but so with Gaga, it was a little different because we it, it came built in with uh, with some some built-in traction. But where where she would just basically say, "Hey, look, this is my my community, and this is what I want to happen here," and so people came. Um, what I will say with that, which place, which was originally launched as Backplane, um, what was hard for us was when we had to pivot away from big brands because one of the things that's a benefit to working with really big brands is you have this built-in following. You also have a, let's call it built-in sense of entitlement where big brands are like, no, well, we're not going to pay you because we're FIFA. Like, why, why would we pay you? You get, a, you get to work with us. Um, or somebody like the Olympics that also kind of does things like this. Um, and so when we went to pivot away from those, and we went back to getting, okay, well, we just want to build a place and a tool for anybody on the web who wants to build a community, manage it, and monetize it in their way. When we went to that, that was where things got really tough. Um, and for that, it was in a similar way, kind of like what we, what we currently do at House Call, which is if you need to get somebody's advice, you need to find them where they are. And so at, at that point, we were looking for communities, so we just started going to car club meetups and like start with a local meetup of like a motorcycle club that meets in Mira Mesa on Sunday mornings. So you were doing things that were not scalable, basically, right? Nonstop. Okay. All that we were doing was things that didn't scale. And until the point when everything broke, and then just fix it just enough so that you can get to the next step, and then that'll break, and then repeat. But I think, like, uh, to that point, like, premature optimization of trying to say, like, oh, well, we need everything to scale, and all of this has to work is the best way to waste your time. Um, because you'll ultimately end up building something that people don't care about. Um, and to Brian's point, like, you can't just build something that sucks. And the only way that you're going to figure it out, because unless you're building a thing to solve your own pain, um, is you don't understand the pain. So you need to go talk to your people. You need to figure out who your customers are. You need to spend a lot of time with them in coffee shops, getting thrown out of coffee shops because you won't stop talking to the customers, in grocery stores, at meetups, whatever, um, and, and just really chasing them down. And like, getting started is, like, I believe, really like it's a hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like, your first few users, you get one at a time. Like, you're not going to have, except in Brian's case, uh, like a million people just overnight. You're going to have one, and then you're going to have two, and then you're going to have 10, and then it's going to be really hard to get to 100. Um, anyway. 
That's wonderful. So, Greg, I have a slightly different question to you. So, you're the CEO of two successful companies which earn millions, right, in revenue. Uh, you also have an, a, two backgrounds. You technical and uh, executive, right? So you can sell things. So in your article, uh, potential tech seller, right? Do you know the article that you wrote on LinkedIn? I think so. so <laughs> well, you're saying there that you should stop trying to be all things to all people, right? And you actually use the term... Um, street paddler, right? So can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so um, that was really specifically geared towards service organizations. Uh, but I think it also plays well in, in, in the uh, software world. Uh, and I think what happens, especially with startups, and, and we've all been there, is you're looking for your first customer. So you're willing to take on any customer. So what ends up happening is you bring on a customer and you know that you kind of sell them what you got and then you sort of customize and you do things and all of a sudden someone else comes and they're a little bit of a different profile and then you kind of tell them what they want to hear and sort of the fake it till you make it type of thing. And then what ends up happening is, is you start to kind of try to be all things to all people, right? And you know, it's like, yeah, I can do that. I work in that industry. I'm an expert in financial services. Yeah, you need me to do UX design, I can do that for you. You know, whatever it is. Um, and what ends up happening is if you try to be all things to all people, eventually nobody listens. Nobody cares. You're nothing to everybody at the same time. Uh, so you know, when you are looking for traction or you're looking for product market fit or you're starting a company, I think it's really important that you become myopic early on or as early as you can and you understand specifically like what's my purpose? Like why do I exist? Like what problem specifically am I solving? And I, you know, I think these guys have done a really good job with it in your company and it sounds like you were able to hit that really early on. But you know, it kind of goes back to like build a product that doesn't suck, but that's you know, that's kind of a generalized term. It's like a product that doesn't suck is a product that actually solves a particular problem. And if you're trying to solve 20 different problems that 30 different people have, you're never going to be able to be able to do that effectively with the product. So understand who your target customer is, what problem they're solving, why you exist, why you do it better than everybody else, and, and you know, kind of growth comes from there. Did you guys write it down? <laughs> so speed of execution, right? That's super important to, uh, to have a successful startup. Um, let's talk about, you know, writing that, creating that, building that first MVP, right? And how good it should it be? And uh, let's talk, with the, uh, let's talk uh, um, about Muzzle app, right, Brian? So tell us, you build it like in three days, right? Um, yes. Super now, fast. If, if we're going to talk about Muzzle, I'm happy to do that. But you're going to have to tell me on a scale of G to NC17, where the rating is for this event. Because I know we're being live streamed over the internet. Yes. Uh, so are we like a PG, PG-13, R? Where are we here? I guess we're all adults here. OK. And so whoever is watching too. <laughs> we're going to like NC-17? OK. So um, if you're not familiar, muzzleapp.com. It's another app that I built. Yeah, I wish we had a uh, slide in the back. Um, yeah, if you haven't been there, I won't ruin the website for you. It's a, it's a brilliant website. I did not make it, so I can say that. Um, here's the deal with Muzzle. I got a call from my friend Brian Burkett, who now lives in San Francisco. He made a terrible life choice. He moved up there from San Diego. Uh, he's watching. Brian, terrible decision. Anyway, so Brian calls me one day and he says, listen, um, I just got off this screen share with a client. And uh, you know how all of your messages now sync on all of your devices? So if somebody texts you, right, you get that on your Mac. Um, well, he was texting with my other friend, Josh, and they had both worked with this client at one point. And uh, Josh texted Brian and said, fuck this client. Um, and that showed up on his Mac with the screen share to the client. And so that was a little bit of an awkward moment. And so uh, Brian called me up and he said, hey, could you make an app that just whenever I'm screen sharing does not show notifications? And I said, I don't know, I'll check it out. So um, four hours later, I had found a way to break Mac OS and, and do that. Um, and so I built the app that afternoon. The longest part of it was just kind of refining it, building the UI and the little preferences window and all that. And we shipped it three days later. Brian Burkett built the website, um, which went on to be kind of a sensation and go viral. And so, you know, the, the idea there is th that was not like any kind of magic sauce for speed of execution. It's just that the problem space was really, really tiny. I had one thing right, that I, that I had to do with the app. And I think um, Greg is exactly correct that if you, if you narrow down the problem you're going to solve, right, and focus just on that, um, that'll help you out a lot. If you try to boil the ocean, 
um, and solve everybody's problem, um, you're going to find that you have a lot less success. And it's tough to do that because everybody will come at you with feature requests, right? And, oh, I just need this one little thing tweaked. And, um, you know, it's like all the people at Apple say, saying no is the, the hardest part. Um, but muzzle was just a really specific problem to solve. So it, it kind of naturally lended itself to speedy execution. So that's uh, actually it's gonna the next question will be to Sean. Um, you you you're all about you know getting that feedback right from users and immediately executing on it. And what I like what Brian brought, what he said that you really need to pick exactly what you want to implement because you can ask 50 people and 50 people will bring you 50 features. So how do you prioritize? Like what should you build next? Well, I think one of the, for, for me, one of the things that, uh, because I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a developer, I'm not even, I'm not a designer, I'm pretty good at drawing sort of cro crooked uh, squares on whiteboards sometimes. And so <clears throat> what, for me, one of the things, like, uh, one of the points that keeps getting brought up is that you want to solve the right problem. And, but the reality is when you set out, you don't really know what the right problem is, or oftentimes you don't. Uh, and so then for me, the question is, okay, well, what problem should we be solving? And then so for me on that, the, the thing that I always found um, success with was rapid prototyping and like really dirty, awful, cheap, quick prototypes like Zapier and spreadsheets and email. Like you can build an entire business with those three tools. And so if you're trying to figure out some interaction or some communication flow or something, um, with Zapier spreadsheets and email or text messages, like you can get something out that's good enough that will start uh, giving you direction, right? So every time that I've gone to, to build some product, no matter whether it's in social media or in FinTech, we'll kind of have like a, I don't know, like a 90 degree view of what the right direction is. Like I think we need to go this way, but it might be over here. Um, and the only way to really figure that out is to kind of start and sort of bumper bowl your way down through what the market actually cares about. Um, and really the only way that I've ever been able to do that is just really, really quickly try and iterate and try and iterate and try and iterate. Um, and then from there, you'll just start catching patterns. Um, and then a conversation that we were having earlier with Brad was, um, was getting over the idea or getting used to the idea that the customer doesn't know what they want from you. So like, I'm often reminded of, there was a study that, uh, a survey that Wells Fargo did in the early 90s. And they said, they went out and they, they, it was early days of the internet. And they went around and they, they asked everybody, what's the, what's the number one thing that you want from Wells Fargo? And every single one of them said, more branches. And that's unequivocally the wrong answer. But what they were trying to say was, I have a tough time getting to a branch. They're too far. It takes too much time to get there. And so what they were really saying was, I want to be able to do my banking faster. And so as soon as you can catch onto those little things, not what are they saying, but what are they trying to tell you, um, I, you'll, be, you'll end up going down the right path a bit quicker. So, of course. I, I want to just do this oh, as a, a shout out to one of your sponsors. Uh, and. You know, it's interesting. So me and him kind of similar sort of roots. I, I actually led the pivot at Bump, which is where he said he was an intern at and, and, and did that. But we became events.com. And we ended up building an entire platform from the ground up. And this all happened when Active, which was a San Diego unicorn, which Mitch Thrower, the founder of Bump, started, moved to Dallas, and there became this um, opportunity in the marketplace. But where I'm going with this is when we launched the product, we went to the biggest trade show in the industry for the event space and didn't even have a product to launch. And we had a team of people walking around with Axure prototypes demoing our entire product on an iPad, showing what it was going to look like. And that's how we signed up like our first 40 customers using purely just actual prototypes, so. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah, I've read somewhere that if you're not ashamed of your prototype, that means it's too late, right? You have to, you have to be ashamed and just ship it. Um, so, Craig, since you the microphone, I'm going to ask you is you have experience running established businesses, right? You have a ton of experience running established businesses, so not startup, right? They already um, proven themselves and they have, um, um, well, so question to you, uh, you know, you also need to think about bringing more people, bringing more client customers, right? So how do you keep your uh, current 
clients happy while introducing, uh, because they need new features, right? They need new things, yet your new uh, users that are using fancy.com, right? They still, they don't need those extra features. They still, so how do you keep your current clients happy while bringing on board uh, new uh, customers? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it varies. And I'm excited, my background is kind of diverse and I've spent a lot of time in B2B, mm -hmm. like true like SaaS, sales, enterprise. And then, you know, right now I'm the CEO of Fancy, which is a B2C customer. But um, I think it's probably more relevant in, in, in the B2B space where, uh, you know, you may have established customers. I think the, the biggest challenge you would face is a lot of times startups do get into a, a situation where to get that early traction, they become somewhat of an agency of sorts, right? So I'm a B2B software provider. Uh, I think of an example, I was with a company called Veruzi that I was um, you know, basically running product for them. And they had NBC as their biggest customer. And NBC made up probably about 60% of their total revenue. They probably did about $2 million a year. And they had built a product on top of NBC's backbone, and it was great because NBC was enterprise and everything they did was able to be uh, applied in other areas, but the negative was NBC expected us to do whatever NBC wanted at any given time. And the plan and what my directive was, was to take the company and scale it. And in order to scale it, you now need to think about you know, everybody else out there. So the, the biggest challenge you face at that, that component is your roadmap needs to now shift from what NBC or your biggest client want or your biggest couple clients want, which are all these different custom features, to now going back to what we talked about earlier, uh, earlier in regards to how do you make those product decisions and looking at what uh, products are gonna help you scale as an organization. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably more art than science. Uh, you can't completely alienate your existing customers, but at the same time, you have an investor base, you have a board, you have these people in place that are saying, hey, look, I, you know, you're doing X amount in revenue, we want you to be at 20 or 30 or 40. You know you can't get to 20 or 30 or 40 with your one or two big customers. So you're gonna have to do your best to keep them happy, but at the end of the day, you gotta look at what the scalable markets needed. You try to overlap as much as possible, you try to do things in a way that make your existing customers as happy with new features that you're developing. Uh, but if you're going to be successful and you're going to be able to scale, you're going to have to eventually kind of move away with the existing customers want and think about what your new customers are going to need. Okay. Okay. So I guess this is uh, very useful for uh, companies that are in B2B or they already have established. So this, whatever uh, Craig just said, it's not really for startups, but for, as I said, like, yeah, so what is it like? Yeah, an established company. I mean, okay. we had traction. We were doing around, you know, whatever it was, $4 million, $2 million a year in, okay. in AR at the point. So uh, what do you, as an entrepreneur, I always ask, uh, what are mistakes I should avoid making, right? So wh uh, what mistakes do you see entrepreneurs make all the time? Like, do you, do you have, Brian, do you have any? I mean, uh, this goes, I have a bit of a personality when it comes to entrepreneurship and I um, don't mind looking like a moron. So that kind of informs everything that I do in terms of marketing and my online persona and the, the way I position all of my work. Um, what I will tell you is the mistake that I see the most is startups abdicate the big advantage that they have, and that is that they are not Apple and they are not Google, right? Um, you are a small entity and you can have personality that those other companies can't. Apple has the sense of humor of a linoleum floor, right? They can't do anything else because they're so massive that if they try to have any personality or any kind of flair or something that is not just corporate all over it, um, they're going to get sued, you know, or Twitter's going to blow up with whatever Twitter is offended about today. Um, you, on the other hand, as a startup, don't have that uh, baggage, right? You can show personality. Uh, and I think that what I see a lot of is startups that try to act like they're corporate you know, uh, Fortune 100 companies and try to project this air of, you know, they have thousands of employees and we're doing billions of dollars of revenue, thinking that that kind of helps them appear more legit or, you know, um, more, I don't know, strong or, you know, like the customers can trust them. And uh, when I see it, I think, all right, John, it's just you and your mom's basement. You're writing code in Xcode, you know, maybe calm down a bit with the massive persona here. 
And I think um, for me personally, what I would love to see is more startups have kind of a personality behind them or not be afraid of exposing, listen, it's me and my partner. And uh, you know what? We're not Apple and there's not a thousand of us, but by God, we will work really freaking hard to make this thing great if you just come and email us and tell us you know, what you don't like about it or, or what features you need, right? Uh, don't give away the small advantages that you have because if you do hit it, you know, if you're the next unicorn, eventually you will also be a linoleum floor, right? Um, so don't, don't trade away the age or the, the section of your lifespan there where, where you have that advantage. Use it. Sean? Um, I'd say mine's a little bit more towards uh, my biggest pet peeve with, uh, with solo entrepreneurs is their refusal to share their idea. Um, and that, that at meetups, they, everybody wants to be cagey and they want to be in stealth mode and they want to be like launching this new thing and don't worry about it. We have a coming soon page up. It's great. We're collecting emails. Like nobody cares about your business. Like your mom just wants you to go back and like take a job at Facebook so that you can pay your bills on time. Like nobody cares about your business. As anybody who's ever like tried to raise money, it doesn't even matter if you're doing well, you still need to convince someone else that your business is worthwhile. So like when, when entrepreneurs hide ideas, they're giving up on, uh, like on what Brian was saying, like they're giving up on their greatest asset, which is that they can move quickly, they have time on their side, they can change things if they need to, and the more people that you talk to, the more different angles that you're going to get. If all that you do is live in Mountain View and all you do is talk to people that go to coffee shops in Mountain View, you're just gonna get the perspectives of people who live in Mountain View. If you ask a thousand people about your, your business and you tell them what you're working on and ask them about their problems and what do they think and where are they from and what's going on like it, by by circulating your idea with more people a you're going to get better feedback b you're going to build more connections and c like you're you're might you might just meet people who have the right connection that you need in order to make the next step um, and I like I think like ideas are a dime a dozen it's all in the execution um, and so like don't be afraid to share your idea. Like, if you're convinced that you have the next Facebook, like, you should be telling everybody about it and getting everybody's feedback and getting everybody behind you. Great, that's the mistake that we actually make. <laughs> so, Craig, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, talk about mistakes, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, I, I, th I think the, the biggest one, and, you know, both as a founder and as well as someone who's, you know, I've kind of become this turnaround guy where I get brought into situations is don't forget about the people. Um, you're, you're, no one's going to be more passionate about your company than you are. And you're, you're going to, you're going to have to make decisions and you may go through situations where there's pivots and there may be layoffs and there's going to be, you know, times where you know the right answer. And it's really easy to be in that leadership role, especially when you start building a team, and to start thinking about the company as sort of like this end-all entity, and all the pieces around it are just like these inanimate objects that are there to like be positioned by you as like the master chessboard person. And you can easily forget, at least I have in early in my career, that these are real people, and they have their aspirations, and they have their wants, and they have life outside of work, and they have their own dreams, and like they have ideas, and they want to be heard, and, and all these different types of things. And I think it's easy for a, a, a founder or a CEO who's sort of type A and driven and has a vision and is like, I'm going to run through every wall in the world to make my startup work, to forget that the only way you're going to ever be successful is if the people that you've hired are in alignment and feel motivated and inspired and loved and taken care of and all those different types of things. And I think early in my career, I didn't do a good job of that. And I, 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 I kind of like took it as a robotic thing. And I think later in my career, I'm starting to understand that it's, it's really more about inspiring your people because at the end of the day, if you're going to be successful, they're the ones that are going to get you there. Wow, that's, uh, so you've touched uh, my next question about, you know, failures and what did you learn from them. But I just wanted to let you know, guys, that we're going to have 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A after the, after the main discussion. So just prepare your questions, okay? So the ones that we didn't cover. Um, so we've talked about successes, you know, fairy tales, right? But well, let's talk about failures. And Craig, you already did say, so you went ahead, uh, but Brian, 
So did you have any failures or is it all fairy tales? <laughs> no, pretty much everything I touched turned into gold. No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, no, that is not the, that is not the case. Uh, I, do, I do have failures. Um, what I like to say about failure is if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to start startups, right, it is not the place for thin-skinned people. Um, one of the best things you can do is get really comfortable being told no and being uh, called names, being told you are dumb, right? Let me give you a little story. Um, when I was in college, this goes way back to it kind of sets the stage for how I got into entrepreneurship Anyway, but when I was in college, I went uh, home for the summer, um, and I went to a local pharmacy. I was going to get a summer job as like a, a cashier or something, and they, t they told me no, because th who wants to hire somebody for three months and train them? And, you know, I, I totally understand in retrospect. Uh, but my dad said to me, why don't you just grab the lawnmower and go cut grass for the summer and do your own business? Um, and my dad is really great at seeing opportunities that I don't, and that kind of trickled down to me. And so that's what I did. I grabbed the lawnmower, and I went out, and I cut grass. That is not the story. The story is this lady, I went around and put flyers in mailboxes, right? This was like a college job for me. This lady calls me and says, hey, can you come cut my grass? And I get there, and the grass is like three feet high, right? It's three feet high. Turns out that what had happened here is I stumbled into a domestic dispute because I mowed this lady's lawn and at 9 p.m. that night I got a very angry phone call from the same phone number. It was her husband and her husband was like, you, I can mow my own grass. I do not need some college student coming to mow this grass. And he just ate me out on the phone for like 10 minutes, right? Just cursing me out, telling me how he doesn't need me, and I, you know, am never to come by his uh, house again. And what had happened here is he hadn't mowed the lawn for like, I don't know, since the Carter administration, and his wife got fed up with it and called me to come and mow the lawn, right? Clearly that's what happened. Um, and so what I did is I got real upset about it for the rest of the evening. And then the very next day, I went to the house next door to his house on both sides in his little neighborhood. And I said, I'll mow your lawn for uh, half price if I can put um, a lawn stake in the yard that says cut by and then the name of the company, right, that I was doing. That last part is not true. I did not do that. That is what I should have done. That is what I would do now today if I could redo it. That's what I want to convey to you is um, when somebody tells you no or they make a fool out of you or you get in that situation, the difference between the people that are successful in startups or that are successful in entrepreneurship is that attitude, right? Like, by God, how you, you should be, you, how dare you question me, right? Um, and then go and make it happen in spite of the fact that you have been rejected. Um, so that's what I have to say about failure there. That's my, my failure story. Sean? Also, don't get involved in domestic disputes. <laughs> um, failure stories. Uh, I mean, I guess going back to Backplane, we, it, it was a really fun ride for quite some time. And we, we launched with a million users. We grew it to somewhere in the neighborhood to 10 to 15 million. Um, we had a beautiful office on the 23rd floor on Market Street in San Francisco. Had about like 150 employees. Um, and then... A bunch of things happened in the economy, and uh, the like late series money pretty much dried up. And I was on a trip, and I uh, I just got a I got a call from our CEO at the time, this guy Scott, and he just said, uh, "Hey man, uh, yeah, so how's your trip?" And I was like, "Oh, you know, it's it's great. Uh, I was I was <laughs> I was up in Idaho learning how to base jump, and um and so I'm um, I'm standing in the the days in, and I get this call, and he goes, uh, "Yeah, uh, it's over." What do you mean it's over? Like we had 25 million lined up and like everything was good and we had all these things going and it was just like, no dude, it's over. Like it all fell through, it's gone. And so then the next day, and then it was like, okay, just hang up. And then like a company that, like uh, a company that I had spent about five and a half years and my entire self identity was wrapped up in, like I was that guy from Backplane. Um, in, in my mind was like just gone overnight. And that is like, as anybody who's gone through like a proper, like a proper detonated failure uh, can, can attest, like that's pretty tough to go through. Um, and I think like uh, I would be remiss to not be speaking to a group of entrepreneurs and like touch on mental health for a second, that like that was really hard. Like I really lost everything that I thought that I was up to that point. Um, and so like 
really the only way out of that is find something else. Like find something else that you are, go through it, and like therapy is not a bad word. Like talk to somebody, like get help, find friends, find a support group, do something. Um, but like I think, and then in coming out of that, really it takes a long time to sort of unwind everything and kind of make sense of it. Um, but I think really, to Greg's point, what, what he said earlier was that I think the biggest thing that, my biggest learning in that was it's all about the people. Um, and like a quote that I got from, from what our, our, our COO, one of the co-founders, was that a company is nothing more than a bunch of people who show up to the same place every day. And as soon as you lose sight of that, then like the people stop showing up and then you don't have a business. Uh, and I think like that, learning that and seeing everybody go through this shock like immediately that nobody saw coming um, really kind of bonded a lot of us and a lot of that, that company has actually gone on to become pretty successful. Um, and I think it was really kind of out of that, that trauma really was it, it kind of codified a lot of, uh, a lot of people's, uh, I don't know, I guess belief that they can come back from that. Um, and, and I guess like, yeah, then that, that I think led to, to hope and curiosity and uh, the, the, the desire to want to get back on that roller coaster again. Wow. You feeling okay, right? Yeah. No? Okay. <laughs> so do we, do we have any questions from, the, from, the, from anyone in the room? Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I was going to say, so I think the question to, to summarize was at what point in, a, in like a business's growth do you think that it, you, you should delegate it? To kind of. A, a component, right? Uh, yeah, some. First, it's all you, right? And at some point, the team needs to come in. And when do you start seeing that? Uh, okay, and then so, okay, so at what point do, does it make sense that you start handing out parts of the company for somebody else to handle it and for, uh, for a team to start to, to form? Um, I mean, I think as early as is feasible with the big asterisk on that, that uh, I personally like running really lean organizations, not particularly because I think it's like a really sustainable thing or it's like cool because that one guy wrote a book on it, um, but because like I think recruiting super hard and I hate firing people more than anything in my life or laying people off, like that to me is like the, the worst thing on the planet. So I always look at that of like, okay, let's, I wanna do the most that I can until like I just actually can't. And when I cannot, then like hand it out. And then once you get to a point where there's some sustainability to it, then I'm a pretty strong believer in like the law of comparative advantage. Like just because I can do something does not mean that somebody else shouldn't. Or that, um, that there's, there's definitely going to be somebody better to be able to do that. And so as, as early as I can feasibly get help to hand something out to somebody is usually when I do. I'm not sure if that. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I think to, uh, to be a successful founder, you kind of have to become a generalist. I mean, you seem like you're a pretty badass coder and developer. But I'm definitely a generalist. Like, I can do a lot of things OK. And, and I think that's necessary, right? Like, you're going to have board meetings, and you're going to be able to sitting down with with investors who are gonna be talking about spreadsheets and dollars and all these different things, you gotta be able to have that conversation. You're gonna sit with your product team and your tech team and they're gonna have technical considerations and you need to know what's feasible and what works. Sales, marketing, all those different types of things. So there's a pretty good chance that you may be really good at something but you're not gonna be amazing in everything. But to be a successful founder, you kinda of gotta be okay in everything. So what I would say and my advice to that is, number one, you start hiring people when you can afford it. And I used to always tell this to my team. Um, when I hire somebody, I expect them to be better than me at what I'm hiring them at. Like, I, I can do a little bit of product management and I have a background in pat product and I might be kind of the executive over product, but I'm gonna hire a product manager that's a whole hell of a lot better than me at product management, right? And the same with technology and the same with sales and the same with marketing. So um, as soon as you get to that point where you can afford to bring people in in those critical positions, go out there and don't be afraid to find someone that's way better than you are. 
Uh, the only thing I'll add to that is I absolutely agree that if you're going to be a founder, if you're going to run a company, um, it pays to be a generalist. I am. I don't have a computer science background. My degrees are actually um, undergraduate business and then a finance MBA. So I am, you know, the MBA through and through. And I, I know that's not. We don't talk about that in the tech community. Uh, I'm like the evil, wicked witch of the West um, because I'm the finance guy. Uh, what I will say, though, is I, I also agree with Sean that staying lean is a great advantage, and that goes back to when you're small, right? Think small and act small. So if you, if you have a specific thing that you need done, right, like you need a killer website built, um, 1099 it. You know, find a designer that you've worked with uh, or a consultant, right, and instead of, you know, paying all the employment tax and all that overhead on a consistent basis, you know, parcel out, figure out what, what part you can parcel out to somebody that you know that you have worked with previously, maybe at a different job, um, and, and do that as a 1099 contract, you know, work. It's gotten more complicated now in California with AB5 and all that, but um, I'd still recommend, you know, doing that early on before you reach the point where Greg was talking about you can onboard somebody full-time, right? Um, and then the other thing I like to do is, like Sean said, there's a comparative advantage to my time. I'm good at certain things, and if I can prioritize my time in those areas and find other people that are great at, say, building the website, outsource that to my, my partner, Brian Burkett, and you know, he knocked it out of the park. That's why we went up to the top of Product Hunt, you know, the website. Um, it helped that the app was good, it worked, it did its thing, but the website you know, was, was killer. And so hire good, competent people and trust them to do you know, what they do best is, is my answer to that. Um, so I am about to launch on Product Hunt this week, and um, I made a bet with a friend that I'd get my first paying user by next week. I don't have a paywall set up, um, and I'd like to target digital agencies for a high premium, um, like $1,000 a minimum. Um, but at the same time, to get my first user, I'd like to figure out a way to basically get that person on board for a discount um, without a paywall. So should I just talk to this user and uh, just kind of like talk about like how how much was the bet for? <laughs> it wasn't for any money actually. It was just kind of for bragging rights. I, I mean, I'll be your first user if it's going to make you win the bet. <laughs> that would be epic. He just got number one product on Product Hunt two weeks ago, so he's kind of got an ego about him right now. Oh um, yeah, so now definitely. Keep, he, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's he got Paul down. Graham to retweet yeah. uh, his product and all that. Um, but basically, like, I don't have a paywall set up. I've been spending a lot of time on the product but I haven't actually integrated Stripe. I don't have a paywall, um, but I do want to onboard users. I'm really just like looking for feedback, um, but I do want to get that user. Um, so what, what's some advice on getting those first few paying users? Should I just like Venmo them? Like <laughs> I, I have, um, so I have accepted Venmo from students, uh, yeah. you know, that, that don't have credit cards and things. And uh, Germany is, is big on not having credit cards, apparently, over there. Um, so I've, I've taken Venmo and Square Cash. It's great. The PayPal doesn't take their fee, and Stripe doesn't take their 3%. So I get to keep the whole thing. Yeah, yeah Venmo's awesome. Uh, I would, uh, again, you, if you're just starting out right, you're small. Don't, don't think like you have to have a, a huge order right, form and a paywall and yeah. you know, have the, all the database integrated. Just do whatever it takes to get money flowing. Right. And you'll find that at, at, it's like a, you know, the proverbial snowball rolling downhill, right? The very first time you do it, it's really laborious. And then as it gets going, it just becomes right. easier and easier and it just snowballs uh, out of control. So I would, I would accept literally, if somebody wants to give you money, don't make it hard for them to give you money. You right, know, take right. whatever payment they'll, they'll offer. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm launching this week, Story Creator app. Uh, it's an online video editing tool. Check, check it out on Product Hunt. I was just curious if you have any authors or books that you would recommend either related to your industry or just in life in general. I absolutely do. So uh, how many of you have heard of a guy named Naval? N-A-V-A-L. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to go to Twitter and you're going to check him out. He says some stuff on Twitter that is very smart. He also says some stuff that is less smart. Um, ignore that stuff. But he has a, a great podcast. It's about three and a half hours long and it is a, a, a combined 
long episode of all of this advice he has put out about founders and startups. He is a uh, VC kind of guy now. He started Founders List and runs that. Um, but if you do nothing else, just go download that three and a half hour podcast, put it on like 1.5 times speed and listen to what he says, except when he says that listening or reading is better than listening to stuff. Um, that's just cause he's old. Um, but listen to that thing. He has so much great advice in that three and a half hours. I can't recommend it enough. I don't know that I have a favorite. I have a definite disfavorite, which was the, you know, you, you'll get more from reading than listening to podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, but I, I highly, highly recommend it. You will, uh, you will find that that will massively open your horizons for uh, startups, entrepreneurship, all of that. If you're in the B2B space, uh, the Saster stuff, Jason Lemkin, any of his stuff's awesome. Um, I kind of geek out on you know, B2B sales, scaling sales organizations, uh, how to build sort of repeatable sales machines, you know, those types of things. Uh, and he's just at the forefront of all that stuff. Great podcast, brings on founders of, uh, of huge companies, all tell the story of, you know, where it came from, how they came to be, and then how they grew, and, you know, mostly unicorn. So another great podcast. He's got a handful of books out there. Uh, Jason Lemkin, it's Saster, S-A-S-A-S-A-A-S-T-R is the podcast. Um, I think I have a, a few that sort of just quickly pop into my mind. Zero to One is definitely like a, a, an exceptional book by Peter Thiel. Um, and then I think another one that I found really fascinating, a, a book that I liked a lot more than I thought I was going to was Inside the Plex um, about the, the early days and kind of the growth story arc of Google. And the reason I liked it was because it, was, it wasn't just like this sort of poetic, like it, these two Stanford guys started a, a type something into the internet and like advice came out. It was very detailed examples of how they solved individual challenging problems. Um, and that's kind of like where my brain goes is I, I, I like just looking at pro solving hard problems in an abstract. Um, is kind of the thing that like keeps me going every day. And so that I think was really interesting, them talking about launching Google in China, them pulling Google out of China, them launching, uh, la how, do, how do you build, or like a, a chapter I found super fascinating was like, how do you lease uh, land, build space, and then structure energy agreements with power companies for building server farms? I don't know how many people have ever done that. There's like six people on earth who have ever done that. And so here was the story of one of the guys saying how they did it. Um, so that was really interesting. And then another one that I go back to a lot um, is this book that I totally stumbled on called The Checklist Manifesto. Um, and it's a book on, it's a study on how, uh, how do high stress, high um, risk jobs do that over and over and over consistently and safely. So specifically, like, how do airline pilots consistently take like a flying germ tube from one city to another? Or like, how do surgeons not kill people more often than they do, right? Like, these are really complex, high, um, high impact, high risk roles that have very specific orders of operation. And so like, how do you do that? How do you build a process around the limits of like human cognition? Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting book. It's like 100 pages. I read it in an afternoon. Um, I would definitely recommend that to just about everybody. So I, I like this question. I got one more to add, and I like this question because I feel like we can leave you with specific things to check out. Um, there is another book called The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. I gave a whole presentation about it, um, but I love this book. It is not how to sell to, you know, there's a ton of books about how to sell, you know, and all that crap. Um, what I love about this is he gives you practical examples, and when you read them, you're like, oh my God, that is exactly how we work as humans, right? Uh, I'll give you a real quick example. So um, they set up an experiment, they have a room, and you're taking a psychology test, and they, all they tell you as the participant is, hey, just come in and fill out this questionnaire. And then they start piping smoke under the door, right? And it turns out that about 92% of people will get up and leave and be like, hey, there's smoke, right? The other 8% are an advertisement for natural selection. <laughs> but the 92% of people, when they're alone, will get out of the room, right, and, and go report it. But then if they put a plant in there who is also taking the test but is in on it, right, and he doesn't react or she doesn't react to the smoke, guess how often 
the other person gets up and reports it. About 15% of the time, right? They would rather die <laughs> than be socially awkward in that moment, right? They look, we look around to how other people are reacting to a situation to judge how we should. Uh, another is um, if you're having a heart attack on the street, always point to one person specifically and say, call 911. Because everybody will stand around and look and be like, are you a doctor? Are, are, are you going to handle this? Uh, what? We all are, in, we, it's like group mentality where nobody acts because we're all waiting, waiting for cues from somebody else. Um, it, that book is chock full of examples like that, and I, I love it. Uh, so I highly recommend that one. Do you guys have any thoughts on bootstrapping versus getting funding? Do you have any preference? Don't, don't take money if you don't need it. Um, you know, if, if, if you can do without raising money, right, um, having that off of your back, it gives you a whole lot more freedom. You know, if, you're, if your product is the next iPhone, you're going to need some money, um, right? So uh, I would avoid taking money for as long as possible um, because it, it just, once you do that, right, you have a boss that you report to and you have people who are going to influence the direction of your company and possibly even replace you depending on, you know, how you structure that deal. Um, so bootstrap if at all possible, unless the thing you're building is just, you know, so massive that it, it requires, you know, money up front. I mean, look, raising money is hard, first of all. So where, where are you? Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of people out there that, that want to raise money and then, you know, they come up with an idea and they got a PowerPoint deck and maybe a wireframe and then they spend the next six months going to market trying to get someone to give them some money and it's like, eh, maybe you should have spent that six months actually trying to build a company or get users or get people on board. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that that's, that's something. I think it's, it's difficult for some people to start a company if you don't know how to develop or you don't have a partner that knows how to develop and it's like, I have a great idea, but I can't really code it. Like, you're in a situation where how do you afford to build that, right? If you can't hack it together yourself, you know, you're going to go into your own bank account, maybe clean that out. In that particular case, if you have somebody that's willing to maybe do some, you know, angel funds, if you have a background, there is something about, you know, yes, you're going to probably give up a, a large percentage of your company, and very true, you're going you're gonna to have a boss, and you're going to have somebody to answer to, and you could easily get fired and kicked out of your own company. But if things don't work out well, you're not left with not a dollar left, right? It didn't cost you you know, however many hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay an engineering team to try to beat this, to build this product, to get it off the ground. Uh, I think later on, when you do get to a per particular point, uh, you need to ask yourself and figure out what kind of company you want to be. Um, you know, there's certain types of companies that you can only scale so fast without bringing in ex uh, external capital. And, you know, I think at that point, you're just going to have to kind of look at where you're at. Yeah, I don't really think I have much to add to that. Uh, short of it, taking money or not taking money, just like anything else, is, is ultimately like a, a cost benefit on how do you want to spend your time. So if that money will help you spend your time more effectively and move towards your desired outcome in a way that you think is, is beneficial, then take the money. Um, with, the cat, with the big asterisk of like, is it on terms that I'm comfortable with? Um, but, if, but then the downside to that is, for every dollar that you take in, there is a certain amount of time that you're going to have to dedicate to keeping that person in the loop and to, to managing that person. So um, it's, it's both a accelerant on, in some fronts that you have capital, you can deploy, you can hire more people, um, you can spend money on acquisition, but then you're also, it's like you're, you're, you're stealing from somewhere. So you're either taking somebody else's money and then you have to manage to them, or you're not, and you're limited by your own capital constraints. We have time for two more questions. Um, any suggestions on uh, finding a co-founder? Um, a lot of the times, it seems like um, you find a co-founder when you're when you're studying, or you know, along the beginning part of your career. Um, any suggestions in like finding a um, a co-founder that you know? can work on your ideas or? I mean, I would say that this is like a, another prime example of why I hate when, uh, when founders are super cagey about what they're working on. Because like, maybe I actually find your idea super fascinating 
and I find your idea better than the thing that I'm currently working on, and I'm gonna throw mine away and come join you and work on yours. So, I mean, I think talking to a lot of people really just uh, increases, I don't know who said this, but like increases your luck surface area, right? Like just more things will fall out of the sky if you just talk to more people. Um, okay, what did you really? I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think that's a great one. Like, and then go through your networks, talk to friends. Like, honestly, like I've had, I've helped friends that I played soccer with start companies. So, I, I mean, uh, business partners can come from anywhere. And like, whether it's somebody that you work with, somebody you play sports with, somebody you met at a meetup, um, or like if you launch it on Product Hunt and somebody's like, hey, dude, this is super interesting, um, or on whatever, like wherever. This is super interesting. Like, I have an idea. Can I help you sell this? Do you mind if I design a site for you? Whatever. Like, just by talking and, and getting your idea out, more people who find it interesting will come to you. Is there a website to find the founder? The founder's love, right? Is there a website where you can actually put, uh, put your who you are and who you're looking for? <laughs> What, what is your current skill set? Are you a developer or are you you're a designer? Okay, so I assume you're looking for like a developer kind of co-founder. All right, um, my advice to you would be, and, and here's the thing, I know this is like, it's all of the ISIS, you know, the Twitter hates this, but learn to code, right? And you don't have to learn to code to the extent that I know it, right? You don't have to be fluent in like 36 programming, not that I am, but um, what I'm telling you is, the resources to learn to code are better than they have ever been, right? So do you have an iPad? Okay, download Swift Playgrounds and, and just go through that, right? And here's what I'm telling you. Don't do that with the aim that you're going to build the product, right? But what it does is it increase your fluency so that when you talk to developers, right, you'll be able to understand, is this guy competent? Is this girl, you know, uh, talking above her depth? Can she really deliver on what I am looking to build, right? Um, so you would do well to, you know, stay off of Instagram, the time where you spend scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or whatever or Twitter, God forbid, Twitter. Um, spend that instead investing in yourself and learning to code to an extent that gives you enough fluency in the area where you can judge somebody else's, you know, baseline competence. Um, so that when you go out and you network with people and you interface with them and you listen to them and they tell you, oh, yeah, I would build it in Ruby, you can be like, oh, well, it was nice meeting you. I'm going to get, you know. Um, you know, you just want a baseline level of knowledge where you can make those kinds of decisions, right? And then assess somebody's talent uh, at, that, at that level is, is my advice. Yeah. One more question. God, not JavaScript. Uh, just uh, like C, just go with a C and assembly. So I have kind of a dumb but obligatory question to close us out maybe. Uh, in the past, maybe, I don't know, 12 months, arbitrary, what's your favorite, most useful physical or digital product? I, I really like how when I wake my Mac from sleep on Catalina, about 40% of the time, the keyboard is dead. That's my favorite product of, uh, of 2020. I really love that. I hope this goes viral, Tim, and I hope that you fix that goddamn bug. <laughs> it happened to me earlier this afternoon. I'm not bitter. A little bitter. You, you know, we, I just moved into a new house recently, and as a uh, gift, our realtor bought us like an entire Sonos system. So we got Sonos like all through our entire house and out in our backyard and blah, blah, blah. And goddamn, that's a great product. Um, so we, uh, House Call, we just moved offices. We moved out of Sorrento Valley up into, uh, or no, we moved into Sorrento Valley. That's right. Um, so we moved from La Jolla to Sorrento Valley where just basically it's, it's nonstop office buildings from as far as the eye can see. Um, but for the first time in my career, I'm at a company where we have an actual Zoom room. And like, uh, does it, show of hands, who knows what that is? Okay, so few. Um, a video conferencing setup in a room that works. <laughs> like you get to start a video conference and it's not seven and a half minutes of can you hear me? Okay, hold on, let me try to unplug this. Um, that I would say has been like the most life-changing <laughs> experience.
Okay, um, I'm just gonna ask you a last question. It's about, do you guys have morning routine? You know, all successful people have morning routine, so what's yours? <laughs> uh, you asked. Um, <laughs> so my morning routine is that I watch my girlfriend get out of bed and go to work, and then I sleep in. And <laughs> she's here tonight and is very bitter about this situation. Um, so if you don't see me leave safely, please find me somewhere. I'll be locked <laughs> in a closet. So similar. I, I, wait in, I, wait, I wait in bed until my wife gets up first, makes coffee. I make sure the coffee's all ready and hot and going. And then I get up and I drink my coffee. I should unfollow all successful people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, but, you know, I take my kids to school every morning. So, you know, it's, it's like waking them up, getting them ready, going get myself ready, grabbing them, driving to school, and listening to a lot of Taylor Swift in the car. Um, I optimize my mornings for laziness. Uh, I, I am not a morning person by any stretch of the imagination. I set two alarms, and after the second one goes off, I get out, and I'm like out of the door in four minutes. Um, I, like, I just, I cannot do mornings. So I've structured a lot of my life around that. Like, one of the things that I do as an example is like every six months, I throw out every pair of socks that I have and I buy, I just go to Walmart and buy like the entire rack of the exact same pair of sock so that I like don't have to match things in the morning. Or like I have 25 pairs of the same plain white V-neck. Like, cause I just hate matching shirts and clothes and things. Like, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would say like, I, that would, that's mine. Like I optimize my morning for laziness and then sitting in 45 minutes of traffic on 8.05. Or to be efficient, right? Yeah, or efficient. To be efficient. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Okay, so um, please follow um, Sean, Craig and Brian on Twitter. Uh, we have Twitter handles right here behind them. And thank you so much for coming today. It was a pleasure. We've learned a lot, uh, great questions. And uh, if you guys want to connect with them, just you know, go ask. I'm pretty sure they can, uh, you, get, you can even get personal advice, right? <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, guys, we've got the building for